Hello, hello. Let's get with another unfiltered live. All right. I'm pulling up the chat. Sounds off on my phone. There we are. Awesome. Good morning from, or good afternoon, I should say, from Porto, Portugal. Today we're going to talk about baristas, home baristas versus coffee professionals, because I think this is actually a really interesting topic that one of you in, in the Patreon, uh, who gets to watch this as it's live, um, brought up. Uh, it, it's something that I've thought about a lot, actually, since since starting down the YouTube rabbit hole before becoming you know a YouTuber or whatever. I was you know I was a coffee professional, and so what I had at home and how I viewed coffee was a lot different than what a lot of home enthusiasts think about coffee. And there's a lot of a lot of reasons for this, but we'll just go ahead and jump straight into it. So first of all, there's a uh, there seems to be two clashing forces whenever you have home enthusiasts that go to a coffee shop and then coffee professionals. And what I often see is on the coffee professional side, a lot of them get really annoyed with home enthusiasts. Okay, um, that's not to say anything negative about home enthusiasts, but that's just the reality. I know lots of coffee pro coffee pros who just cannot stand home enthusiasts. And, and the flip side is somewhat true, not necessarily completely. I know a lot of home enthusiasts really enjoy coffee pros, but they don't enjoy going to cafes. They think they make better coffee at home, which honestly is likely the case for them, right? <clears throat> so what is this tension? What What is it steeped in? Why is it coming this way? Why does it seem like a lot of home enthusiasts know more about mechanics and about uh, theory than baristas do. Well, it boils down to this. For the most part, especially in the U.S., I've seen it's it's quite different elsewhere. But in the U.S., a lot of baristas, I mean, they're paid very, very, very low wages. So that is their job. They come in, they make coffee that is repeatable between all the baristas, and they make it in a way that is um, efficient. The workflow has to be fast uh, in order to crush the the rush. Even if it's a mini rush, even if it's a slow cafe, they're going to have, you know, at some point, six people in line, they got to go through quickly. So they need an efficient way to do things. And not only that, but they're not really paid to think about their job outside of their job, right? They're paid to do their job. They go in, they enjoy it. You know, some of them do. Some of them may not enjoy it as much. But for the most part, I find that a lot of these people enjoy their jobs. That's why they're they're taking a job uh, in a cafe. But they they don't want to really have to think about it outside of the cafe. Same with a lot of us with our jobs. When you have a job that's your full-time job, you don't go, go home and think about your job. You want to do something else. So maybe they're into video games or maybe they're into Frisbee golf or maybe they're into, I don't know, whatever it is they're into, right? They go home and that's what they do. But for home enthusiasts, this is their passion. It's their hobby. It's their what they do in their free time when they're not thinking about work. They think about coffee. And so because there's not a specific way of doing it that they have to adhere to in order to maintain a specific quality or a specific presentation, they're able and they're free to use their time to explore and to, you know, do weird things like slow feed and WDT and all these other things that aren't necessarily capable to be done in a high volume environment. So you have a lot of home baristas that then will go to shops and expect the baristas to know everything they've read on Reddit or seen in YouTube or done all these other things on their own time. Whereas the barista is not necessarily paying attention to that. Their job first and foremost is taste and is to ensure replicability. All right, repeatability. Let me take a sip from my Dragon Ball Z Super Saiyan mug. Oh, nice. So with home enthusiasts, you have a different approach altogether. You have the capability of really nerding out over your coffee. And there's the desire because this is kind of your, your break. It's your break to play with coffee. It's fun. You want to try out new things. Now, I said there is a difference between the U.S. and the rest of the world. And I think what I've seen when I visit shops in Asia, Australia, or Europe, I see uh, I do see more nerdiness with the baristas. And I can't, I don't want to speculate as to why that is, but I see across the board, there tends to be more, more willingness to like allow it to consume who they are. And that's not a negative. I am all coffee. So that's absolutely not negative because I'd be dissing myself there. So I see a, a lot of, uh, I have a lot more baristas, I think, that follow me um, and, and want to do these types of things, these experiments that are also baristas, like they do it in their free time as well, their spare time. And I see that more outside of the U.S. than I do in the U.S. And I, like I said, I don't want to speculate as to why that is, but it does seem, seem to be the case. Um, 
but it's it's interesting anyway. So whenever home enthusiasts go to a cafe, they're expecting the latest trends to be. And they're like, oh, this is a person who, who coffee is their is their life. It's their job. They should know everything I know and more. When in reality, they know other things than you know, and you know other things they don't know. And so they're not going to be ripping turbos or they're not going to be doing blooming espressos or extract mundo dose or things like that, because that's not realistic in a cafe. They're using commercial machines, which have very limited capabilities, and they're doing things in a way that tastes good across a multiplicity of drinks. They don't have the, they don't have the, the, freedom to dial in different coffees for different purposes. They need to have a coffee dialed in to a specific ratio so that it tastes good in a milk drink. It tastes good on its own. It tastes good in a frozen beverage or whatever their menu calls for. So they're kind of stuck in a very specific position where they need to make it taste in a certain way to cover a multiplicity of beverages. Now, of course, there are luxury cafes. There are places like Substance in Paris where he he does everything himself. He 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 brought up to me uh, the, the the idea of total football that came out in you know like the seventies or whatever. And his whole idea with his cafe is he wants to be a total barista, so he does everything. He roasts, he brews, and he does the full cafe experiment experience with reservation only. But that is a very unique situation wherein the person has the freedom because he owns the business and he runs it all uh, with his partner to do what he wants. And so he's able to dial in all the pour overs to different ways. He's able to do all these different things because he charges a premium and it's reservation only and things like that. But in a typical cafe, you're not going to walk in and, and likely have a better shot than you brew at home. And it's because you've had the capability of sitting there and brewing and brewing and brewing and brewing, even if you have a much cheaper machine than what is in the cafe, which you definitely will. Commercial machines are really expensive. So that is a very important thing to kind of understand. And on top of that, a lot of baristas just don't care about the FAF if it's not translatable to a cafe. So why would they spend their time researching why's distribution technique and how effective it is when there's no way you're ever going to put WDT on bar? Now, of course, we do have the auto comb, which that was Matt Perger's kind of desire was to get WDT automated for the bar, for a bar flow. So you could have something that you could beat around and it's not going to get hurt on bar. And you're going to be able to have that consistency that WDT tends to afford over just typical grind direct to portafilter and tamp or using the OCD or something like that. So a lot of these professionals just, they don't, they don't care. It doesn't relate to them because when they're at home, the majority of coffee pros I know, unless they're sponsored or an ambassador or have won things, the majority I know just have like a Barazza Encore or Virtuoso at home because they're not brewing coffee at home very often. So they're not playing around with all these different parameters. Most of them don't have an espresso machine because most of them I know can't afford a nice espresso machine at home. They may have a cheap one, but for the most part, and I'm painting in broad strokes, I know they don't have that. Now, when I, when I was mostly a barista and was also doing, you know, I've always done a lot of stuff, but as a barista, what I had at home was a virtuoso. I had a Brazzo virtuoso and I had no intention of upgrading. It was what I had. I enjoyed it. It did the job for weekend coffees or whenever I wasn't working and I enjoyed it. Um, you know, there are different ways that I went about using it, but uh, if in the end it was what I had and I wasn't worried about upgrading or anything because, well, I was using multi-thousand dollar commercial machines every time I went to work and it didn't make much sense to me to invest in something more for home. And so I didn't, I never had time to play or to experiment because at home I was pretty limited in my setup. I then eventually got an Oscar, um, a similarly Oscar espresso machine that I won in a latte art throwdown. I eventually uh, switched out. I sold that and I ended up getting a Breville dual boiler. Um, after I won a competition, I also won a Linea Mini and I sold that. But that's because I was very successful in different competitions where there were pretty big sponsored prizes. Sold Linea Mini, sold the Oscar, and ended up you know, getting a dual boiler and pocketing the rest of the money. So then I then I did have a dual boiler at home and I eventually won a Brazza Sete at a competition and I transitioned from the Virtuoso to the Sete and that's how I was making espresso at home. And eventually, obviously, uh, I started doing a lot of experimentation once I started um, doing social media a little bit more intensely and was getting into the forums. So most baristas I know, most coffee professionals I know, whether they're green buyers or roasters or baristas, most of them are not anywhere near a forum. They're not doing that in their free time. You know what I mean? Um, and that's not an, in, uh, an, an, an indictment to those who do that do in their free time. Like I said, it's a differentiation of priorities. People who work eight hours a day in a cafe don't want to go home and read about coffee. Some do, 
but that is the minority. Okay. I know that, that I have a lot of baristas in my Patreon. So you are obviously in the minority. The, the So many people just, that's not what they're looking to do in their free time unless coffee consumes them as it does me. So that is one thing that should really be understood is going into a cafe and you're like, oh, I love coffee. I want to nerd out with this person. Likelihood is they're not going to really want to nerd out with you. That doesn't mean there aren't shops with someone to nerd out on. And I know a lot of, I've been to a lot of shops where, you know, they, they're, they're very willing to do that and want to do that. But the reality is, unless it affects them and their job and their position, for the most part, it's, that's not really, that's just not really a reality. Okay. Um, and again, I'm painting with a broad brush, painting with broad stroke. There are definitely places that have people who will 100% entertain these conversations, but the what baristas are more so worried about is efficiency, consistency, and whether or not it's tasting well. Now, what I will say is, with all the innovations that have come from the home enthusiast community, there are there are I wouldn't say necessarily innovations that come from baristas, but there are trends that come heavily from baristas in the coffee professional world. So, in the home brewing world, we have these these terms like grind finer. We have these ideas of extract higher, like even though I know that the high extraction is now being pushed back against again, but for the longest time, that was this huge desire on home barista forums to extract higher extractor. 28%. Oh, I got 29% on this. First off, no, you didn't. You don't know how to use a refractometer or you're using a cheap bricks meter and it's not translating well and you're inflating numbers or you're doing the calculation wrong. But that's that was kind of the idea. But in the coffee professional world, at the same time, you had a big trend to lower and lower extractions in order to showcase a lot of the it, it, like qualities of some of these coffees that people were brewing, especially these alternative processes. So I've covered multiple times in past videos that at the Brewers' Cup Championships, typically people are brewing at 17 to 18% extraction with a much higher TDS. But at home, the goal was like a 1.2 TDS because you're doing such a massive ratio in order to extract really highly. So now we have people start coming back to the trend that the baristas were setting, which is really chasing the flavor and screwing all the numbers. Now, I do think there's a happy medium where we can be informed by the obsessions of the home communities and we can be informed by the taste preferences of the professional world. And there's a nice intertwining there. And I think that they're necessary. It's a necessary liaison to have. And I think that liaison has always been there, but it's just been met with a little resistance. So I've said this again many times and I've written an article in Standard about this, but a lot of the trends in mechanics have come from home barista enthusiasts. So, you know, in the early 2000s, I think it was 01, you had Andy Schechter put a PID controller on his espresso machine, his home Ranchilio. He has nothing to do with the coffee world, but he's an engineer and he put on the PID controller on it. Now, this had never been done in the coffee world before, which is shocking because PID controllers had been around at that point for half a century. But he put one on there and then it was online. It was on forums. And guess what? La Marzocco picked it up and then everyone picked it up. And now it's like, you must have a PID controller. But that idea came from a home barista, not from a barista. And it's, again, it's baristas are not engineers. There are some engineers who are baristas, again, broad strokes, but they're not engineers. What they're doing is they're tasting, they're chasing taste, right? And the home baristas are, taste, are chasing efficiency. They have this much amount of coffee to dial in each day. So there's a different approach a priori, right? Then you have like John Weiss is the one who figured out the Weiss distribution technique. You have Gregory Scase, who's the one who, you know, figured out that thermal stability was actually something lacking in machines. And we needed to really test that even with PID controllers. So you have a lot of these massive innovations coming from the home community and over time are implied to the barista community or the coffee professional community. And then they just take what they're given and they optimize that system because they're not limited on the coffee they can use to dial in. They're not limited on these other factors that home enthusiasts are limited to. But, um, sorry, I'm reading a comment. I think the clash between professionals and enthusiasts is a thing in many industries. My professional career is in tech and it's the same. Yeah, it's the same there. Yeah, in, in, in tech, definitely will be the same. And it's gonna be, it's gonna be like that in everything. You have people who are enthusiasts about everything and they know more oftentimes than the people who are professionals. Like for instance, if you're a, a football fan, I said that really weird, a football fan, and you know a lot about, you probably know Ronaldo's stats better than he does. And he's the professional, right? You may know the different like setups of, of 
how how the uh, game should be played defensively. You may know more than that than some coaches do. I don't know. That that's just kind of the idea. If this is something that is your passion, you're you're incredibly invigorated by it, and it's all consuming who you are. There's a likelihood you know more than professionals do in that same field. Now, this doesn't obviously apply to people who have like PhDs and you have like a pocket chemist, someone who sits on their couch and reads a chemistry book and thinks they know everything. There's obviously limitations to this analogy, but yeah, I think you get what I'm saying. You have people who are incredibly enthusiastic about things, and especially in an industry like coffee that's so young, there's a lot that's not known that can be discovered. And so you have people who are brilliant. You have these engineers and these chemists and these, I had someone comment on a video the other day and, or, or on Reddit or somewhere saying they were, or, or um, they had their PhD in organic chemistry and all these brilliant people who are more than qualified to study this agricultural product that are not professionals, they can lend knowledge that coffee professionals would never be able to get to unless they had similar studies, similar backgrounds, similar academic training. So there is that liaison is a necessary thing, but it is not, it is not, it's not often welcome, I should say, because there are a lot of massive statements made from the home community that rubs improperly with, with professionals. And I, I say this because I, you know, I, I worked, you know, a little background on me. I started as a barista in the fall of 2014. Um, I was working through graduate school and, and became a barista. I didn't really drink coffee, but I did it. And um, so I was a barista and I didn't care. So people could would come in and talk to me and ask me questions. I didn't know the answers to them because I was there to fill up a spot that was open. Okay. And I was good at it. I'm, I'm good. You give me a job, you show me how to do it. I can do it. And I can most like probably exceed, do pretty exceedingly well at it. And so I was really good at it, uh, and but I didn't enjoy coffee. We were serving a very traditional style coffee, and I'd never had specialty at the time. I know that's shocking, right? 2014, I'd still never experienced specialty coffee. Maybe I had at some point, and I didn't know it. I, it, I was never uh, impressed by anything. So I didn't really like coffee. I would drink maple lattes with a lot of nice organic maple in it, or I would drink vanilla chais, just to be honest with you. And so... Uh, but I had to drink the espresso and I had to learn what it was supposed to taste like. And I would dial into taste. And that was like, okay. It was fine. I just didn't really enjoy the espresso, but I knew what it was supposed to taste like. So over the months, I really got into latte art and I got um, like really, really into it. And by March of 2015, I started an Instagram uh, at the behest of a friend who was like, you should post these online. I'd never seen anyone else do latte art. There were people in my cafe who sort of did it, but I I exceeded them within three weeks of being a barista. So I had never really seen what was capable with it. I just had my my boss at the time, it described to me what patterns could look like and I tried to chase it. So so then I started to go to coffee shops and I had some, you know, some Instagram clout, which back then there was not many baristas on Instagram posting latte art. Um, and so people assumed I knew more about coffee than I did just because I had an online persona. And uh, I, I simply did not. There were people who would act like they would see me at these throwdowns. And because I was a professional barista, they assumed, and because I was, you know, skilled and, and was winning things that I would know X, Y, and Z about these extraction theories or processes or roasting or whatever. And I simply did not know. And it's because I was working through graduate school. I was studying other things in my free time. And I was dating the person who'd become my wife. And I just didn't have time for that. I didn't have time for it. And I didn't want to do it in my off time. <clears throat> it wouldn't be until, um, I think May of 2015 that I had my first cup of specialty coffee and I was blown away and I like absolutely obsessed over it. And then, uh, a fo the following year, uh, was when I decided to, um, drop academia and, and pursue coffee full time because during that year after having my specialty cup, I, I became pretty fanatic about it. That being said, I still never touched a forum ever. I was very much secluded in my coffee professional world, going to these expos and, uh, festivals and, and chatting with other professionals. So I was very much in that world where it was like taste reigns. You work with the equipment you have at your cafe because there's nothing you can do about it. You don't have any charge. You're not in charge of it. So let's figure out ways to do better. So I'd follow Matt Perger. And I, he was very much barista focused, especially at the time um, when he was doing his newsletters over email uh, with Barista Hustle. And I would read those and I would, I became the trainer at the shop and I was teaching all of that. And then we'd have, you know, classes, we'd have people come to the shop and I would teach them milk steaming. There's actually a fun picture of me teaching it. My first class ever back in, 
I think it was 2015, uh, my first public class. And um, you can see similar sketches that I use nowadays um, on a chalkboard that I drew up while I was teaching. But even then, if someone came up and asked me about the extraction dynamics in a siphon, I, I wouldn't know because I'd never brewed a siphon at the time, maybe one, you know, or, or what would... Um, if someone asked me about flats versus cones, I would have known nothing. I mean, to be honest, to be you know, to be fair, I don't think many people at all knew anything then uh, about the di the differentiation. Um, it was it was so highly. I mean, there were some talks online and at expos people talk about it, and then of course on forums it was going on. But when it came to uh, baristas, we were using what we had. Right? They were like, "What's the point in looking and lusting after something else that might do better when there's no nothing we can do about it?" Right? So that's the position a lot of baristas are in. And then, of course, as I continued on, I didn't even get into the home forums till probably around COVID time. Uh, so I never was really exposed to that uh, until around COVID. And uh, and it's because I did my Brewer's Cup routine in 2020, right before COVID. I did my Brewer's Cup routine, and it was a pretty innovative, you know, it was a pretty innovative thing uh, where I removed the fines. If anyone has seen that routine, I did a video on it when I started my YouTube. But um, Scott Rayo was there and noticed it, made a post about it. There was a barista magazine article about it there was um there was some some articles written about it and then people all over the world were like you know this is this is this is cool let's chat more about it and so you know i was doing my own thing as a barista uh, and it, i will say though i would not have ever thought of doing any of those things though if there wasn't competition to urge me to it so even then i wasn't even playing for the sake of playing I was strictly doing it in order to do well in this competition. I wanted to bring something innovative. So using my knowledge of how coffee worked because of the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of shots I'd pulled and manual brews and batch brews and roasting, everything else, all of these processes that I had a good understanding of, I was playing and, and kind of discovered something. Um, so that's that. it's around that time I, I started to get more so into the grittiness of coffee. And so that, that's that's kind of the situation most people are in, unless they're competing and they're like intentionally setting aside time in order to really consider what they need to do in order to improve because they have maybe more of a budget due to their cafe or, or coffee company sponsoring them to compete or something. Unless something like that's going on, it's very rare to find someone that's spending their free time, uh, you know, playing around because what like, what's the point, right? So there is there when you go to a shop, you should not, especially if you if you're very proud of the espresso you pull at home, you've pulled it like to your parameters. You can't go to a shop and expect the same quality as what you're getting at home. And it's not because they're not capable of doing it. It's because they have to dial in again to what maybe the cafe owner wants or the manager wants or the front of house wants uh, and, and in a way that's easy, repeatable, consistent, that can fit a lot of drinks. So you you have places like in L.A., you have Endorphine or Jack. He, it's a one-man show, and he has a mod bar, and he dials everything in all differently, and he's very meticulous about it. You do have those shops. You have shops like that, but that's not that's not a typical specialty cafe you're going to walk into. You're going to walk into one where a lot of the baristas, that's the job they got because it was flexible, or uh, they like the aesthetic of it, or um, something along those lines, which is absolutely fine. Everyone needs a job. And they're just, they're going to do what they were trained to do. And that's about the, the long and short of it. Barista turnover is very high in most parts of the world. And a lot of it's because of wages. Some of it's because of burnout, um, being asked to do a lot or being looked down on by society. You know, oh, you're a barista. What do you want to do? That happens all the time. I was asked that many times. Okay, you're a barista. So what's next? What do you mean what's next? Like that's so, that's so diminishing. So I, I just think that's a really important message to kind of get out is there is a chasm between home enthusiasts and coffee professionals. And it's not a bad chasm, but there's a chasm there that should be recognized. And, you know, uh, getting upset at, at cafes for a bad experience, if it's bad customer service, I guess that's one thing, you know, you never know what kind of day someone's having. But if it's like a bad extraction or you don't enjoy the extraction or something along those lines, you have to take things with a grain of salt, right? Because they're serving not just you. That might be what they have found the majority of their customers do like. That's the other thing is there. there's like, I would have people come in and they knew how we pulled shots and they preferred something different. They would request it. It was a little annoying, but I would do it because it's like, okay, in the end, whatever. This person comes in a lot. 
and they're not asking for something difficult. They said same parameters for everything. Just literally let it go for 15 seconds longer. They wanted just a bigger shot. Okay, I don't care. Just let it go 15 seconds longer. It's fine. But um, yeah, I, I think I see a lot of shade on all oh, the 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 pour over was horribly was horribly done. It was awful. Again, you have to take all these things into account. What I can tell you is at Onyx, something that we do that I think is very smart. Um, I, uh, uh, to be clear, I, there are things I would change on how we do things in the cafe, but I'm not the one, I'm, and I don't want this job, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go in and be um, super argumentative about it because I don't want this job because it's very difficult. We serve so many coffees that we have to have a system in place that is very easy for how many baristas we have. We have like five locations. We have like 90 baristas or something, right? So with turnover there, you got to imagine it's pretty high. And so we're constantly, you know, having to retrain people and make sure it's in a way that's easy to replicate. So what we do is we actually have our express machine set to a certain volumetrics. Then we dial in the dose and the grind size of the coffee to fit that output. And then same thing with our pour over. We have a set output or set amount of water we pour and we'll change the dose and the grind size. And that way it's like, okay, every time you do a pour over, it's the same pouring structure. It just might be 24 grams as opposed to 25. And it might be dialed on a six on an EK as opposed to a 6.5 or whatever it might be with espresso. It might be that it's a two on an EK 43 versus a 1.8. It might be 18 grams versus 18 and a half grams. So we do this in order to make it as easy to like plug and play as possible. And we do that across our cafes. Now, is the way that the espresso, like if we have on the Costa Rica Las Lajas Natural, is it the best way it could be pulled? Absolutely not. No way. But that's impossible. It, it, well, I guess it's not impossible, but it is. Im, it, it's That's pretty difficult to do when you're serving. We do like four single origins at a time plus two blends and then all the different pour overs. It's very difficult to dial everything in to what it needs to be on a rotating basis daily. So you have as good of a representation as you can do under the circumstances, right? Now, hopefully it will be, you know, at an 80 or 90% of the potential that it has. But in reality, because there's so many different ways of making espresso and because home enthusiasts are doing so many different ways with their decent espresso machines, their Flare 58s and all the profiling capabilities they have, it's likely not going to be as good as you making the same coffee at home, doing what you want to do, nerding out, Okay. I just want, like, this is my apologia for baristas and for coffee pros is when you go in, do not expect to get the same taste as your blooming style shot at home or as your declining pressure profile you do at home. Or um, even if you do have just a flat nine machine, don't expect it to be dialed in the same way. Maybe you like a more truncated shot. Maybe you found with that naturally processed Ethiopian Hambalabuku, maybe you like a one to 1 1.5 because it really gets those berry notes and you've had it from this roaster, but they're brewing at a one to two and a half. You, you 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 just they're using different water they're using different setup that it's it's all just a different thing and they're they're doing what they can with the strictures that are placed upon them okay okay now um i feel like there was another mini rant i wanted to go on with this differentiation but i think i, I hit most of it approaches the fora the um, yeah so we'll, we'll look at we'll look at some comments now. We'll look at some comments, see, because I'm sure there's some nice comments going on. Let's see. I gotta open up the chat on my phone. There we go. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, someone made a good comment. It's more like an art rather than a work itself, like when you do a table or any wood furniture, like something functional rather than handcrafted. That's good. Um Yeah, I'm in the watch repair business. That's actually cool. I love watching watch repairs. That's I would love to watch you do what repair watch. That is sweet and very you have to be very skilled. Um, the number of coworkers I have that don't give a crap about need um, about nerding out over watches is pretty sizable. I think the work versus outside passion is definitely a thing. Yeah, absolutely. Like if it's something you do and you have to do it, and it's something that like there are days. Maybe there are days where you're like, screw it. I don't even like want to play with coffee. I, I actually, I know there are days like this. You just want a cup of coffee. It's like, I don't feel like messing around. Just give me a freaking quick cup. I've done that. I had someone send me drip bags for a while there. I was doing drip bags because it was easy. It didn't taste good, but it was easy. And I wanted caffeine and I just was like burnt out. I was like, I don't want to brew a cup. I'm going to have to brew 47 later today in preparation for this video. I just want a cup of coffee. And so there are, because it's work, 
because once it switches from pleasure to work, there's a there's a there's a switch in your head, right? And you kind of like don't want to do it. You don't want to talk about. It. You don't want to nerd out over it. Um, and and that's definitely. I had someone once when I was training. I used to train a lot uh, when I was uh, working. Um, uh, when I was living in Memphis, I used to like travel around and train. And I remember one time I was training a shop, and I know the owner got so mad because one of the one of the baristas literally put her head down and she started falling asleep. Just. I was so, I felt so disrespected. I was like, am I that boring right now? Holy crap. But it's work, right? Like it's hard to get really stoked about work. Um, I find that in my favorite cafes here in Poland, the baristas really know their stuff and can geek out with you if you chat them about coffee. Yeah. And so that's what I was saying is it seems to be very much, what I was saying is very much inclusive of the US. I, I don't think it's as inclusive around the world. I think you'll have more nerdy coffee professionals around the world. That being said, I still think the amount, even in Europe and Asia, the amount that are active on forums, I think is still very small. Um, you, you just, it's not as typical. Uh, I will say I've seen a growing amount of people getting on the discords, uh, like on Espresso Aficionado, you get like a purple label on your name if you're a professional. There seems to be more and more of those popping up. Now, I don't know if that's just like roasters or if it's manufacturers or whatever. I know a lot of them go in for like feedback on machines, but um, yeah. <clears throat> I worked at a cafe with two part owners. One was there daily as a baker and barista and kept logistics in check. And one was more creative, nerdy type and introduced lots of fun stuff. See, that's the greatest thing is a lot of times now I always recommend when people are hiring, like you, it's, it's a must. Like I meet in the U.S., there are a lot of people who open up shots just because they can. It's a romantic notion to open up a cafe. They open one up. They don't know anything about it. What's the first thing I need to do? You need to find someone and pay them well who is, who's in love with coffee. You need someone who can helm your training, who can helm the, the dialing in of coffees, who can do all of that because they enjoy it, right? Someone who's going to actually put in the time and effort in order to improve it. You need that person. You need to pay them well. You need to put them on a track to where they'll stick around, right? Because that is, it is important to have at least someone on staff who is really into it. But the reality is, at least in the U.S., it's, it's, the passion is not as widespread. And even in Australia, you'll have a lot of people who are super passionate. You see all the com competitors in Australia. It's a very competitive nation when it comes to coffee competitions. But you'll go to cafes and especially the, the ones that have massive volume that do breakfast and whatnot. A lot of them don't know. Even when I was in London, I'll say, do you have a washed coffee? I don't know. Let me check. And they're they're sitting there. They have no idea what, what I meant. And they're like, uh, well, we have a Columbia. I was like, well, is it washed? I don't know. Uh, we have an Ethiopia. Okay. You know what I mean? So it, it's, it, it's, I've also noticed that in specialty shops in, in London and in, in other places of the world. Um, but yeah, let's see. I've had experiences where even asking about which water temperature they would recommend for the bag of coffee I was buying was met with annoyance and also breezes who were actually happy. I asked, yeah, that will happen as well. Like there, uh, when, because, Like I said, that water temperature is a thing that's a nerdy step that you need to take in that passion, right? So there's a lot of people who aren't really thinking about it because they have set temperatures at their cafe. So they're just doing what the set temperature is. So why would they think about anything else? They go home, they just mimic that. They're probably brewing the coffee from their shops. A lot of cafes give baristas like a bag of beans for free or something a month. And boom, they're just replicating what they do at work. No thought. No thoughts added. They love making coffee. They love the customer service aspect, the hospitality. They love these other things. But why would they sit around and, you know, look at the intricacies of the Samo bloom doing like a 60, 70 degree bloom and then bring the rest at a different temperature? That's not relevant to them, right? Um, as a customer, if I were to enter a cafe, all I'm expecting is to have similar, if not better coffee than what I can do at home. So that's, and that's what I'm saying is I don't necessarily think you'll have similar or better. You could. But it just depends on how they're dialing their coffee in, right? It depends on what they are doing with their recipes. Because, again, you have to take into account when you're brewing at home, you're not brewing so it can fit into 14 different drinks. You're not brewing in a way that needs to be good in a 10-ounce latte or a 300-mil latte, 150-mil cortado or whatever it is. You're brewing and dialing for yourself, which you can optimize however you're wanting. You can do whatever ratio you want, et cetera. So maybe there's a coffee that they're serving that's great you found on an Alange at home, but they're serving it as a one to two ratio. And it's because that's the only way it shows up in milk. So they're also making espresso that way. And it's fine. 
but it's not as good as you're making it at home, right? So I think even that expectation, I, I, let's say this, I never go to a cafe and expect to have the best coffee. That's never a thought in my mind. And that's fine. I think cafes are great. I love going to them. I go to them all the time. I go more so for the environment, but I'm not going to be blown away by the coffee. Uh, I might be going to to like taste the coffee and see what it's like at 70 or 80% of what it can be. And then I think, okay, I can probably do this better at home. And I'm probably going to get this bag because it tasted like it'd be something really nice. Or it did taste really good. And I think it could be better. So I, I, that may be a bleak view of it. But um, that's honestly kind of how I how I imagine it. So if I ever show up at your cafe, if you're a barista, don't worry about making me something because... I don't really care. Um, I just, I'm going because I want to be there. And if you make me something that's awesome, that's incredible. But uh, I would say more times than not, you know, I get, uh, you know, less than stellar cups, which is, I understand. And I always tip big because I've been there. Um, it's really not a big deal. Um, also the speed we as home baristas make a drink versus someone who has to make several dozens an hour. Exactly. You're able to meticulously prepare, grind, single dose, do all this different stuff. Whereas they're in the cafe, boom, 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 heating up grinder, the mythos, which is always hot, giving you horrible heat damage. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, it's, it's all about speed, right? Um, let's see. I never thought that the hobby amateur side of coffee had so much influence on the professional side. Oh yeah. The hobby amateur side has a ton of influence. I don't think I, it's not direct hobbyists to the professional making the drinks. It's more so hobbyists and manufacturers are paying attention. That's what is, that's what I'm seeing. So for instance, in my recent video, a lot of people it, it, like it, it threw online for a storm. I've never, I've never actually had that amount of in, in unintentional influence, I don't think, uh, uh, since that uh, distribution video. And I think one of the big things that will come of it, even though it was met with a lot of resistance, understandably, um, I think what will come of it is similar to what happened with, you know, well, it's not going to be to the extent of a PID controller. That's a much bigger innovation, obviously. But I think if uh, if Andy Schechter was a YouTuber in the early 2000s, it wasn't even around in 01. But let's say that, let's say that PID controllers had never been made, right? And right now, I jerry rigged my machine like he did i put a pid controller i made a video about it the backlash would be even more insane because people are like no you don't want making good coffee now why do we need to keep adding stuff to our machines why do we need to do this that and the other that's just overkill you're being ridiculous the coffee is good you just need to flush the group head once and you're good to go and so i, I think doing something like that distributor breakdown is i know a lot of manufacturers watched it i know this for a fact many reached out and people are working on solutions so it may not affect directly my video to a barista or Andy Schechter's PID to a barista, but it affects how manufacturers approach creating new equipment. And that in turn will affect the barista. Baristas never introduced WDT on bar. Matt Perger, who kind of straddles that barista and enthusiast world, he did see the WDT, he made an auto WDT, and now it's in cafes. So that's what I'm saying is there is a massive impact from enthusiasm to that world in the same way that fans kind of dictate what genres of music are popular, right? It's it's that popularity and the push towards this type of, obviously that's a broken analogy because that's more of fandom and it can be terrible music. But you get what I'm kind of saying is that push, uh, th there's something to it that needs to be kind of paid attention to. Let's see. My story in coffee is the complete opposite. During COVID, I started craving for caffeine and got, I got a basic belonging and learning via internet, but never got to the barista world, which is a very common story, honestly. So many people during COVID got a machine because they couldn't go to cafes. And they started making it at home and then they got into the rabbit hole. And then once you're in the rabbit hole, you kind of, you're, you wake up in the morning excited to fire up your machine and to make your own coffee. It's still fun to go to cafes, of course, but having that power over your own cup, that that bit of time you have to yourself to to do a science experiment, essentially, while also enjoying the outcome of it. That's a very fun meditative thing. Of course, every now and then you're going to want to not do that. But um, do you have tips as to how to feel out if a barista is open to talking or at least getting into the details of their preparation? Buy a bag and ask for tips, whip out a TDS, ask to WDT the shots. No, I would not do the latter two things. Um, whipping out a refractometer or because they're just going to see that and be like, oh my God, this person is being ridiculous. You know, that because again, you never know what type of day they're having. You never know what interactions have already happened that day. Now, I do think 
simply watching them and how they approach their job is a pretty good indicator. So a lot of times you'll see them with a refractometer and they're measuring it. Or I remember once I saw someone with a toothpick on bar back in 2016 and you know, they were obviously open. They, they were someone that did follow home barista. And so I was talking to them. That was my first introduction to WDT and he was using a toothpick to do it on a Malkunig uh, peak. And so You'll, you'll see, you can see if they're taking these intentional things or if they're meticulously doing a pour over as opposed to kind of like doing this and just checking time. Um, there are ways to kind of observe and see, uh, but you can also, you know, you can also just bring up that you're really into coffee. And here's the thing. If someone wants to talk about it, because I was one of those people, I wanted to talk about it. As I got more and more, I wanted to nerd out with customers. I was one of those people. If I hear someone's really into coffee, I'll instigate a conversation. What have you been drinking? How do you brew your coffee at home? And so I had this really great couple. Um, they, they were probably 65-year-old couple that would come wherever I was working in Memphis. I pulled shifts at a lot of shops to make ends meet. And um, this couple would always come. And he, he actually emailed me sort of recently. Uh, maybe it was like two years ago. But it was, uh, it's been a while since I've seen him in person. But he would come. And they, he and his wife traveled around the world a lot. They loved going to brew, beer festivals. But he was big into coffee. And he was on the first 1,000. He had one of the first 1,000 decent espresso machines. But he would come in and bring me coffee when they went to Germany. Like he brought me coffee from the barn. And he would shower with these things because he came in once. And he was like really. And he liked the machine. We got the first layer steam in Tennessee. And he came to see it and was like, this machine's awesome. If you comment on the machine or something and not expect a conversation, they'll like, if they're wanting it, they will come in, in, in with it. That's the thing is if you, if there's someone there that wants to talk about it, they will hear and they will talk. That is, I can guarantee it. If someone wants to talk about it, they will hear and they will talk. There's no doubt in my mind that will happen because people who are passionate about it. Love to hear customers that are passionate about it. Like that's easy. If you go in and you make a comment like, if you go into a shop and they have, you know, uh, the KB90 and you're like, oh, cool, I've not seen a KB90 before. Um, I'd love to watch, you know, how that port filter goes in. They might get really excited that you know what a KB90 is. And they'll be like, that, that's the thing is breezes aren't stupid. They know a customer should know a KB90 unless they're into coffee, right? Or a customer should know EK43 unless they're into coffee. You go and you ask that. If they're wanting to talk, they're going to talk. That's just buttoned up, sealed, good to go, bows tied you're in it. All right. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't whip anything out necessarily or ask them to, to do something. It would be more so just kind of drop, drop something, drop it. Like if they're making a pour over for you and you're up and you want a small talk, just be like, uh, you know, um, oh, what ratio are you using? That is enough lingo for them to pick up that, you know, what you're talking about to an extent, but they know that you're, you're brewing at home and then they may, you know, oh yeah, what, what, what do you do? And how do you, how do you typically do it? We aim for this. What, how do you aim? You know? And so, um, so yeah, I think that's, a, that's a good way to instigate a conversation is by softly letting them know that, you know, roughly what you're talking about, right? They don't want the, the biggest no, no, the biggest no, no to do is to go into a cafe and act like you know more than they do if you're wanting a conversation because it's their job and that's definitely a pride thing. I would be prideful about it. Even if you had someone come in who did know more than me, I would be prideful. If you came in and you started saying something I couldn't follow, I wouldn't want to talk to you at that point. Like that's definitely, a pride. it's my job. It's not your job. How the heck are you going to come in and, and make me feel bad without even needing to, but you're making me feel bad that, that a customer who's not being paid to do this knows more than me. You know, so that I would definitely wouldn't do. Don't go in and say something that like they wouldn't know. For instance, a lot of baristas may not know WDT. I wouldn't go in and say, oh, do you WDT? Because then they'd be like, well, what is that? And then you have to teach them. They immediately feel smaller. And that's what you don't want. If you're wanting to have a genuine interaction at a cafe, that's what you don't want. And the thing is, I can guarantee you, most baristas can definitely teach you a thing or two about taste because they've tasted more espressos in a week than you do in a year. So there's definitely a lot that can be shared over a cup of coffee or uh, as you're sitting there because this is their job and they have to do it and they have to do it well, right? So I think just an easy way is dropping that, you know, something that you that they should know as a barista there, you know, oh, I, I had that. I had that washed bourbon and it was fantastic. Do you know if uh, you have something similar coming on the menu soon? Even that is more than enough of an olive branch for them to pick up. You're following the coffees. You're not just picking based off taste notes. You're following the coffees they're releasing and you're, you're, you're knowledgeable about it, right? Um, or even if you go to a shop you're visiting from out of town and you see uh, a, a coffee from a farm you've had before. Oh man, I had this coffee from Proud Mary and it was fantastic. Were you... Um, 
uh, I may pick up a bag because I'm curious how y'all your iteration is or this roaster's iteration. Any honestly, anything like that to where you're not bringing in something that's potentially not known by the barista. Uh, and I'm not trying to, by the way, I'm not trying to couch the feelings of baristas. I being a barista for as long as I have, I'm just I'm telling you from my own personal thing, knowing how these interactions work. That is the best way, right? And Brees is also, they shouldn't make you feel lesser either. That's the big customer service thing is whenever someone comes in, you don't want them to feel stupid. That's why whenever I'm consulting cafes, I always tell them, make the point of sale obvious. Make where they order obvious. If they come in and they don't know where to order, they're immediately going to feel stupid and they're and it's going to be a bad experience. You're setting them off on a bad tone. <clears throat> the best cafe I know of that has made this so incredibly obvious, and they did this in their architecture, is uh, Loyal Co Coffee in Colorado Springs. They actually designed their shop so that visually you knew exactly where to go. They had on the ceiling, part of the design of the ceiling and the floor was essentially a red carpet to the to where you're supposed to order. It wasn't red, it was like gold, but it was part of their color schematics, but it literally ushered you to where you're supposed to go. You walk in, you had no question where you were supposed to go. And there was a barista waiting for you. And it was like, this is obvious. But oftentimes you go to these shops and you're like, where the frick am I supposed to order? And then you immediately feel stupid and it's not a good time. So baristas, they're trying to not make you feel stupid. And then you don't, and if you do know more than they do, you should not make them feel stupid or lesser or that you're trying to, that's the thing is if someone comes in and, and like, you're immediately trying to, you know, flex that you know a lot that you've read um, that you watch, you know, James Hoffman or whatever, that's, that's not going to be accepted well. And I, that's one of the biggest critiques I know from professional baristas. They despise when people come in and say, oh, did you see that James Hoffman video? Don't do that. I'm telling you right now, don't do that. <laughs> people get so annoyed with that. I've heard that dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Um, that, that it's just, oh yeah, I watched the Hoffman video the other day. A lot of people don't like a lot of coffee professionals don't watch coffee YouTube. Even my friends who are supportive friends don't watch my videos. If they do, it's like one every now and then if it's relevant to them, but they're not going to spend their time outside of work watching me rant about coffee. Right. So though, I think those are good tips. All right. What is frustrating about being a home coffee enthusiast is that it's hard to be really impressed with coffee in a cafe. Absolutely. Yes. So that, and that's, that was my point earlier where I say, I don't, I have the mindset when I go to a cafe, I know my, my studio cafe is the best cafe in the world because I'm brewing to what I want, right? I have a specific way I want to brew. I have a specific coffees that I like, and I know going out, it's not going to be eclipsed. If it is, that's awesome. And I'll be ecstatic, but I don't go looking for that. I'm going for um, the reason I go to specialty shops is to support specialty coffee in general is to uh, commune with fellow coffee professionals is to, you know, meet with other people and talk over a really nice cup of coffee, maybe get someone else into specialty because those cafe experiences are so important in my opinion, because they kind of open a world of luxury, I guess, in the coffee world. But yeah. Uh, what advice would you give to an enthusiast that wants to get into specialty coffee industry? And so I, it's very difficult. This is a common question I do end up getting uh, quite often. Okay, I'm going to stop in 13 minutes. We're at 47 minutes. Good grief, I ranted a lot. Um, so this is a question I get a lot is, first off, how do you get into the specialty industry? And then how do you make a career out of it? Uh, both of those are, 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 the first one's easier than the second. The first one is be a staple at a local shop be a staple there uh, and, and show that your enthusiasm and, you know, make friends with the baristas. That is the easiest way to get into a position. Easiest way. I know at the shops I worked at, we would often hire people who are regulars. It was easy. We know that they're passionate about coffee. They know our brand. They know our coffees. They know the baristas. That's an easy fit. That's like a no brainer. Boom. Done. Um, if you're trying to go to another city, that'll be a bit harder, but, uh, you know, if, if you're watching my channel, you can always just say, let me prove to you my skills. Right. I've actually, no, the funnest thing, actually, one of my favorite things about this channel is when I get people message me saying they had never worked as a barista, they went in and they got to prove their skills and they learned strictly from my channel. That is like one of the most rewarding things ever. Um, or people got, you know, upgraded a trainer or something. And it was based off of, um, some of those tutorials that I posted a while ago, but anyway, that 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 is probably the easiest way is to go in as a production worker at a roastery, 
because a lot of times you can go from production if you're in with the the company and they get a barista opening you can switch over or you can stay in production you can try to become a roaster um or or the barista route so those are the two definitely easiest routes to get in to the specialty industry but the thing is is if you're wanting to move up within the industry you de- let me get my dog from outside he's messing with the construction worker real quick Aki. Okay. All right. Um, So those are the two easiest ways to get in. But you want to make sure if you're trying to make a career out of it, that you need to hitch your wagon to the right horse. And what I mean by that is you need to have a workhorse. You need to have a company that is intentionally trying to grow because if you're at a small independent cafe, unless they are owners that are like very benevolent and have no desire to like hog all the profits, which sadly is not very common, um, there's not much there's not much of a ceiling, right? You need to be in a place where there's room to grow. So like a big roaster or a wholesale roastery or something along those lines where you have a higher ceiling so that you can continue to grow and then it can decorate your resume. If you're at a small independent cafe, unless you're wanting to stay there forever because and they have good rates where it can, you know, it can justify you staying there. Unless you find something like that, you need to be in a position where your resume is being built and you can continue to move through the coffee industry uh, in various positions. So it, it's a very difficult question. Now for me, to give you insight, I, I've done everything under the sun in coffee and it was a struggle there at the beginning, big time. I started at that one shop as a part-time employee doing like 20 to 30 hours a week. And then I moved to Memphis and I started working with a roaster that promised they were going to open a shop. And that's why I started working with them because they were, they were going to make me manager. But uh, I was there for over a year. That never happened. So what I ended up doing was doing a lot of roasting, a lot of packaging. Um, I helped with some of the green buying. It was a three-person operation, really two-person, me and one other person. Um, I did a lot of packaging, the wholesales, which I didn't get commission on. <laughs> that, uh, and then I would do pop-ups for them. And then I also, because the the our shop that was never open. Uh, it was like, oh yeah, next month, next month, next month. What I started to do is take, I took random shifts at cafes around the city. I worked at like a French, uh, French cuisine place. And I was, I went and had to overhaul their Astoria to clean it, make it actually. Okay. Um, took me like six hours and I had to, and I worked uh, at a pop-up or a place downtown. And, um, anyway, so I would, I hopped around doing all these different odds and in jobs. And then I, there was a manager position, um, at a shop that was being built out. And so I got on early there and was able to actually do a lot of the design. I picked all the equipment. I hired everyone and I was the manager for like eight months. And then I, then I went over to Onyx. So it was a solid four years four yeah, about four years of hopping around, working a lot of different shifts, barely scrubbing pennies together to make ends meet. Um, and then I m- went over to Onyx and I got into wholesale. Uh, I did some barista shifts, especially during COVID when things were iffy there for a bit. I did a lot of barista shifts again. But um, for the most part, I've done wholesale and brand direction at Onyx. Uh, and so it was getting in with Onyx that really uh, solidified and made me feel easy, made me feel like I could make it in the coffee industry um, when I when I hopped on with them. So it, it's not it's not an easy pathway to, to choose, uh, at least not now. Um, maybe I know in Australia, it's definitely a lot easier because they pay a whole lot more. So if you want to move to Australia, it's like their starting pay is like 25 an hour or something, Australian bucks, but still. Um, yeah, around the world, there are definitely places where it's easier. Um, and now with the rising minimum wage in the state, so it's still, it's still not great, uh, for the cost of living. But when I was a barista, it was $7 and 15 cents an hour, um, for my, my work week. It was great. Um, but yeah, so, uh, when you get to an unknown city, how do you choose what cafes to try out? Are there things that you notice that show it as a good specialty place? Yeah. So used to, my thing is I would look at Google maps and I would see if they had an EK 43. If a shop had had invested in an EK43, I knew that they were at least trying because that's a $3,000 grinder. You're not buying that unless you're like trying, right? That doesn't mean they're going to be good, but I knew that they were likely specialty, right? So I would look at that. I also try to find pictures of roasters on the walls and see if it's like someone I know or if the packaging, honestly, sadly, you can, for the most part, tell if a roaster's uh, especially based off the packaging, but um uh, so that was my, that used to be my like number one thing. I would look at their express machine. I'd look at if they had an EK 43, uh, because a lot of people would just opt for a bun for 800 bucks instead of an EK for filter coffee. But if they're doing it on an EK, I was like, all right, 
they're, 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 they're trying. So that was kind of how I used to do it. Now in Europe, honestly, if I'm going to a European city and I don't know shops, I look up European coffee trips map in the States. I go to the city and I type in specialty coffee on Google maps and I'll scroll through what pops up. You know, Starbucks will pop up, things like that. If you scroll through and I'll click, I'll look at reviews. I'll look at the pictures. Um, uh, because in reviews, I don't care if it's three stars. I don't look at that. What I'll look at is uh, what people say. Uh, like if someone says, oh, they had a great Burundi by Proud Mary. Okay, well, they carry Proud Mary. They're specialty, right? So anyway, um, is it possible to have a coffee shop with the home enthusiast quality and passion? It would have to be very low volume. And there are shops like that. Like I said, Jacket and Dorphine does that. But it's he can't. He, it's one person, so it's a very long wait. If he's crowded, you're. It's going to take forever. Um, Substance does it, but it's reservation only. And if they're in a lot of cities, they're not very financially viable. You have to be in a city that's big enough that has people deep enough pockets to commit to being like a twenty dollar person day, right? Like those shops, you cannot have people come in and just get one cup of coffee. It needs to be in a situation where they're coming in, they're doing a big bill because you have less bills per day. So the average needs to be higher. So yes, you could do it. Is it, is it reasonable in most places? No, it's not reasonable in most places. Is it happening in some places? Yes, it is happening in some places, but it's not, it's not something that will, it's not a very good replicable business plan. Yeah, you would need to be in a big city, first of all, where there's enough enthusiasts that would come that want to spend that money. Like I said, Paris works well for substance. They're always booked out on their reservations. Uh, and, and so that's great. He has a very, like his coffees are very expensive. So like I spent like 90 bucks when I was there or something. So when you have something like that going and it's in people, people, it's a big enough city where there's enough people to where the likelihood you have enough enthusiasts that will go and support it, then yes. Uh, LA is in Dauphine and Paris is the other. So when it's like that, sure. But if you're trying to do it in a smaller city or a, a city that's not as coffee cognizant, probably not going to work. Um, uh, I had a pretty good experience at Rosslyn in London where they entertained by many questions about their setup. They even showed me their water filtration system. Rosslyn's great. Uh, I love Chris up there. They've, they've got a great operation and they have awesome baristas. So, um, and he's very intentional about how he hires. So there are places that will have more hits with people that are uh, passionate um, than misses. Uh, and like I said, there are those places. And in fact, I would bet you most shops do have one person that's working that will be interested. It's the way that you approach it. Um, I prefer filter, but a lot of cafes don't offer pour over, but only batch brew. The problem is that I never had a batch brew where there was no taste of the thermos. What do you think possible? It's definitely possible to not have thermos taste. Like that's just, they're not switching out their thermoses uh, frequently enough. So the thing is, is a batch brew. I actually prefer getting batch brew when I go to places because the pour overs are so hit or miss and it's much easier to get a good batch brew. The issue is, is if they're not changing it out every hour and a half or so, or every hour, uh, you will get that, like, it, it, I wouldn't say a thermos taste, but you're getting uh, that prolonged heated taste where the acids are breaking down. It's tasting gross. Um. What commercial grinder do I enjoy? It's sad. There's so there is so much room in the market and commercial in the commercial grinder realm for good grinders because so many of them are so bad. I would say if we're talking on demand espresso, really the only one I recommend people get for the most part is uh, Hopper Fed is the Malcuna G80. But even that, like, there's so many issues with. There's it's it's shocking that there's not like a really good commercial one. The Bentwood would be my choice, but it does, it takes a really long time to grind. And since it's not grind by weight, it's a little less than ideal. But I mean, taste wise, the Bentwood, but like I said, it's not as ideal for bigger cafes. If it's a small cafe where they're doing like two kilos a day, Bentwood would probably be fine. But when you're ripping out more than that, a little more difficult. Um, Daddy Hoff talked about the coffee industry and painted kind of a negative picture that the specialty coffee industry right now is peaking and it will get more difficult from here on. What's your take? I guess I'll need to know the context of what he's talking about. It, it, I don't know what you mean by peaking right now and it will get more difficult. I don't know what that means. It will get more difficult. Maybe I'd need to, I would need to hear what he says exactly to know the context in order to respond to that. Um, but yeah. I will say it's a very odd time we're in with the coffee industry with all of the automation coming in and the um, the desire to automate things so that you have less baristas. I'm not a fan of that, but um, 
Yeah, I would need to know exactly what he said in order to respond. Glitch Coffee in Japan is a 10 out of 10 experience for the home enthusiast. Yes, that and so is uh, Omeda Sando in Japan. So Japan, that that's the thing though, is Japan is a different world altogether. So we need to take Japan out of this because Japan, they, I mean, they created hand brews, right? They have so many niche hand brew cafes. And because in Japan, they never had that like Folgers Maxwell house kind of um, start. They went straight into really nice coffees. Now, a lot of them roast a lot darker than I would prefer, but their approach is very nerdy. And it's because that's where hand brews kind of began, right? Obviously, you have cowboy cocks and things like that. I'm talking about intentional gooseneck kind of uh, certain patterns and, and making up theory as to why what's happening. So yeah, in Japan, they have a lot of those types of places where they use single dose vials and freezers and they have massive menus of roasters all over the world. That is a very Japanese thing, yes. Um, but as we're talking about, that's such a minority of the world um, that didn't, I just didn't bring it up. But yeah, Glitch Coffee is a very well-known one. So is Omeda Sando or Coffee Mamaya. They go by both names, kind of. Um, there's a bit of crackling. Oh, no. Oh, it's probably the background. There's a uh, construction going on outside. Um, to me, cafes that serve specialty coffee need to ensure that what they describe the beans are as what they serve. You don't need to follow the recipes, but the least you can do is utilize the gears you have. Cafes that serve special need to ensure that what they describe the beans are as what they serve. I don't know what that means. Are you saying the taste notes? But at least you can do is utilize the gears you have. If you're talking about taste notes, that, that's that's also a difficulty because it depends on if it's a local shop, so you have the same food background, in which case taste notes are still difficult because a lot of it is, I mean, it's also subjective. But um, that that's just, that's difficult if you're talking taste notes. Other than that, I'm not sure... Generally have good experience visiting cafes that serve specialty coffee here. In most cases, the only criticism I have is the beans I use. Yeah, that's a, that's my number one criticism of places because I'm very picky with beans. What are the differences? Um, let's check on I do like going to cafes to try out their coffee here and there. I find that it's not often that it's better than the same beans at home, but it's still a fun experience. Exactly. It's a great way to try a lot of different beans. It's a great way to get plugged in with your local shop. Great way to meet people who have similar enthusiasm or passions. Um, yeah. I mostly go to cafes that are basically just the roaster brewing the coffee at the back in a micro roastery. Oh, that's cool if you have a lot of those around. Um, if I live in a rural area with one or two specialty cafes within a 20 mile radius, do I got to move to a city or just open my own cafe somehow? I need a career in the coffee world. Honestly, opening your own cafe wouldn't be bad, but you would need to do market research if it would be a viable option in your area. Uh, that's one of the big issues is in rural areas that the the customer base is not as widespread. And so it may be really difficult competing with two other cafes unless unless you think that there is a desire for, you know, that style of coffee house. Otherwise, moving to a bigger city is always going to be helpful finding a job. But you can try creating your own thing and just starting out drawing people in with a, maybe a more eclectic menu than you would normally want, a more, I'm, I'm sorry, a more diverse menu than you you would probably want uh, in order to draw people in. And then over time, you can kind of get rid of things. It is harder to take away than to give, obviously, with that. But uh, it, it is a bit difficult. I don't think Australia is an option, but thanks for answering the question. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, seems shops pay a living-ish wage. That's not, sadly, it's not accurate at all. Uh, most shops do not pay a living wage. Um, based off of the living wage standard, what you need to make per hour, which is like 17 an hour in the States. Most shops do not pay that. It's very rare to find a shop that pays living wage. Um, I am proud to say that Onyx is actually the highest rated uh, certification of living wage. Um, I can't remember what the, the the official title of it is, but we do pay living wage um, at the highest rate. But um, but that is something we've been working for for a while. It's it's that's like a that's a big expenditure that most, most especially small cafes can't afford, um, or maybe they could if they shuffled things around and put priorities there. But uh, that is not a standard. That is, just so you know, that is not a standard in California. You'll get like fifteen an hour, which definitely isn't living wage there. So living wage also depends on where you're living. Uh, in Arkansas, it's like seventeen fifty an hour or something. Um, but yeah. Another, uh, what was the one in LA? It's endorphine, E-N-D-O-R-F-F-E-I-N-E, -E -E. endorphine, endorphine, whatever. Um, but yeah, his name's Jack, only guy there, and he's there every time they're open. So if they're open, he's there. Um, and they he he only does Nordic style coffees, 
Uh, he has a mod bar and he does everything very in a very particular way. Wears like rubber gloves or whatever, little little hospital gloves. Another high quality specialty option is to do it as a food truck. Correct. Yeah, food truck is great. Food truck's a great option. Um, okay, cool. All right. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this one last question and then uh, I'm going to head off because I'm over that hour mark. If you order a pour over during a kind of busy time at a shop, how much extra would you tip for inconveniencing their workflow? I'm not a great one to ask because I tip a lot at coffee shops because I love baristas and I know that likely they're not being paid very well. Uh, so I always tip quite a bit. So if it's a $5 pour over, I'm probably paying with a 10. So I do, I mean, I'll, I'll do, I often do 40 to 50% tips, um, but sometimes 100%. Just depends. Uh, so I'm not a great one to ask. Now, if I'm being objective and I'm thinking as a barista, I, I mean, I, if you did a, if it was a pour over, a $5 pour over, you did a $2 tip, I think that would be great. I think that would be really appreciative of it, honestly. So, yeah. Okay. I think that's uh, I think that's good. I hope the audio wasn't crackling. I hope it was just the outdoor sound because I hope there's not something wrong with my audio. I have everything plugged in. But um, thank you for joining for the rant. I hope it was helpful. I hope that you know you you kindle up some nice conversations with coffee pros there, and if, or if you're a coffee pro, that you look for these types of conversation because I think the liaison between these two worlds is really important for the promulgation of specialty coffee around the world, which is my biggest goal. Um, I've, I've said that since the beginning. My, that's why I was making the tutorials is to have baristas be empowered, but also to, to spread the wealth of specialty coffee, get more people in it, more people excited about it. The more we can join force, forces, the more we can take over the 94% of the coffee in the world that's commodity and turn into specialty, right? So um, I think that's about it for today. So I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave you be. Uh, yeah, I hope everything's good. I hope that you, you brew something tasty today. And cheers. <laughs>